Good morning, and welcome to AminoGen's fourth quarter and full year 2019 Financial and Operating Results Conference call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn the call over to Courtney O'Connick, Senior Director of Corporate Communications and Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for joining today's call. Earlier today, we issued a press release that includes a summary of our recent progress in fourth quarter and full year 2019 financial results. This press release and web stream of this call can be found under the Investors and Media section of our website at immunogen.com. With me today are Mark Entity, our President and CEO, and Anna Birkenblit, our Chief Medical Officer. Teresa Wingrove, our Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs and Quality, and Dave Foster, our Chief Accounting Officer, will also join us for Q&A. During today's call, we'll review key accomplishments for the business over the last 12 months, our financial results, and upcoming milestones. During the discussion, we will use forward-looking statements, and our actual results may differ materially from such statements. Descriptions of the risks and uncertainties associated with an investment in immunogen are included in our SEC filings. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Mark. Thanks, Courtney. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. In our comments this morning, Anna and I will recap our progress over the last 12 months and then highlight the milestones we anticipate for a productive year ahead. 2019 was a challenging year for us. As we reported in March, the Phase three study for our lead program, Mervituximab, did not meet the primary endpoint. Since then, we have restructured the business to reduce our costs, prioritized our portfolio to focus on our most promising programs, and worked closely with FDA to define an accelerated path to approval for Mervituximab in ovarian cancer. With the benefit of these steps, we've emerged with strong prospects for immunogen as we move into 2020. In particular, looking at the business today, the data we've generated from the Phase three study of Mervituximab give us a clear view of which patients benefit most from Mervituximab and how best to identify those patients. This, in turn, gives us confidence that our next studies with Mervituximab will produce positive outcomes. To this end, we have aligned with FDA that a single-arm study in women with folate receptor alpha-high platinum-resistant ovarian cancer who have been previously treated with Avastin could support accelerated approval. We call this study Soraya and expect to enroll the first patient this quarter with top-line data anticipated in mid-2021, followed by a BLA submission in the second half of 2021 and a potential approval in 2022. Beyond the first approval, we have ongoing studies to expand the potential indications for Mervituximab with additional data this year. Our portfolio also includes three additional programs targeting a range of tumor types in both hematological malignancies and solid tumors, each with important milestones this year, which I'll cover in a moment. From a financial perspective, we ended 2019 with just over $175 million in cash on the balance sheet. We recently completed an upsized follow-on offering that generated roughly $98 million in net proceeds. We will provide detailed guidance later in the call, so suffice it to say that this cash position will allow us to advance our portfolio through material inflection points, including the initial approval of Mervituximab. With this combination of assets and an experienced management team, we are well positioned to execute on our strategy and generate significant value both short and long term. As a reminder, we have set three strategic priorities for the business. First, obtain an initial approval for mervituximab as monotherapy in platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, and then look to expand into earlier lines of therapy. Next, accelerate our early-stage portfolio with an emphasis on our program in hematological malignancies. And finally, expand our reach, gain access to complementary capabilities, and strengthen our financials through partnering. We have made significant progress with each of these priorities and expect continued momentum as we head into 2020 with a number of important milestones this year. These include, for Mervituximab, opening the Soraya trial in the first quarter, continuing to enroll patients in our confirmatory Phase three Mirasol trial, and presenting data from our platinum agnostic and platinum sensitive combination studies. For our program in hematological malignancies, we continue to advance IMGN 632 in the clinic and expect to present monotherapy data in BPDCN and MRD positive AML, along with combination data in AML at ASH later this year. For our preclinical programs, we expect to file an IMD for IMGC 936, our novel ADAM9 targeting ADC, 
during the first half of the year and to advance IMGN 151, our next generation FR Alpha targeting ADC, into preclinical development. So an exciting year ahead. Turning to our financials, the details are covered in the press release issued this morning, so just a few summary results. For the full year 2019, we generated $82.3 million in revenue, comprised of $47.4 million of non-cash royalty revenues and $34.8 million from license and milestone fees, of which $15.2 million in related cash will be received in 2020. Operating expenses were $174.4 million, comprised of $114.5 million in R&D expenses, compared to $174.5 million in 2018. This $60 million decrease was driven by lower expenses resulting from the restructuring of the business at the end of the second quarter of 2019 and the closing of our manufacturing facility at the end of 2018. Lower external manufacturing costs due to the activity to support commercial validation of Mervituximab in the prior year and decreased clinical trial expenses driven by lower activity in the forward one phase three clinical trial. GNA expenses were $38.5 million compared to $36.7 million in 2018, primarily due to higher allocation of facility-related expenses for excess laboratory and office space resulting from the restructuring. In addition, we incurred a $21.4 million restructuring charge in 2019. We ended the year with $176.2 million in cash on the balance sheet. As I mentioned earlier, we strengthened our cash position with an upside follow-on offering, which added approximately $98 million in net proceeds to our balance sheet. In terms of financial guidance for 2020, we expect revenues to be between 60 and $65 million, our operating expenses to be between $165 and $170 million, and our cash at year-end to be between $170 and $175 million. We expect that our current cash, inclusive of the proceeds of the follow-on offering and anticipated cash receipts from partners, will fund our operations into the second half of 2022. With that, I'll turn the call over to Anna to review our pipeline progress in more detail. Anna? Thanks, Mark. First, I'll review Soraya and Mirasol, and we'll then provide details on our presentations at ASH. Soraya and Mirasol, as part of a productive dialogue last year, FDA advised us that a new single-arm trial in patients with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer could support accelerated approval for mervituximab, provided that overall response rate and duration of response surpass those of the best available therapy at the time of regulatory action. As part of this guidance, FDA advised that the relevant benchmark for currently available therapy is a 12% overall response rate. Based on this feedback, we will begin enrolling patients in Soraya this quarter. Soraya is a pivotal, single-arm trial evaluating mervituximab monotherapy in approximately 110 women with platinum-resistant ovarian, primary peritoneal, or fallopian tube cancer that is FR-alpha high as measured by PS2 plus scoring, who have been previously treated with bevacizumab. We have reviewed the data generated from our previous trials with mervituximab, including a pooled post hoc analysis of our phase three forward one trial using a PS2 plus rescoring method to assess tumor samples for FR alpha expression, along with patients from phase one, and have identified 70 patients whom we believe would have met the key eligibility criteria for Soraya. Each has platinum resistant ovarian cancer with FR alpha high expression and received one to three prior lines of therapy, including prior bevacizumab. Based on an analysis of these 70 patients, the overall response rate was 31.4%, with a median duration of response of 7.8 months. We believe that these data compare favorably to the response rate seen with single-agent chemotherapy in platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, which was 11.8% in the Aurelia trial and 12.2% in the Corail trial, both of which included patients naive to and previously treated with bevacizumab. As Mark mentioned, we expect to report top-line data from Soraya in mid-2021 and, if positive, submit an application for accelerated approval of mervituximab based on these data during the second half of 2021. Moving to Mirasol, 
You may recall, following the results of our Phase 3 Forward 1 study, we conducted exploratory analyses to assess the factors that may have contributed to a negative statistical outcome in Forward 1. We identified what we believe to be the key factors and designed Mirasol accordingly to improve the probability of technical success, including reverting to the original PS2 plus scoring method to select those patients most likely to benefit from mirbituximab. Mirasol will enroll approximately 430 patients with folate receptor alpha high, platinum resistant ovarian cancer, who have been treated with up to three prior regimens. Patients will be randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive mervituximab or an investigator's choice of chemotherapy, paclitaxel, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, or topotecan. The primary endpoint is PFS by investigator, and the secondary endpoints are overall response rate, overall survival, and patient-reported outcomes. If we receive accelerated approval for mervituximab based on the results of Soraya, we expect that Mirasol would serve as a confirmatory trial to support full approval of mervituximab. We look forward to continuing enrollment in Mirasol this year and expect to report top-line data in the first half of 2022. In parallel, we continue to advance our combination cohorts with mervituximab as we look to move this drug into earlier lines of therapy. We anticipate presenting updated data from our Phase 1b Forward 2 Platinum Agnostic Doublet Cohort evaluating mervituximab in combination with Avastin at ASCO this year, and updated data from our Platinum Sensitive Triplet Cohort evaluating mervituximab in combination with Carboplatin and Avastin in the fall. Lastly, we plan to initiate in mid-2020 an additional study in platinum-sensitive disease evaluating mervituximab in combination with carboplatin. This will be an investigator-sponsored trial in over 100 patients, randomizing them to either the mervituximab-carboplatin combination or an investigator's choice carboplatin-based regimen. I'll now briefly review our progress with our early-stage portfolio. At ASH, we presented updated safety and efficacy findings from the dose escalation and expansion of our Phase I study of IMGN632 in patients with relapsed or refractory AML and BPDCM. IMGN632 is a CD123-targeted ADC that deploys our most potent IGN payload, and the updated findings demonstrated anti-leukemia activity across all those dose levels tested, along with a well-tolerated safety profile and activity at doses up to and including 0.09 milligrams per kilogram per cycle. We have selected a recommended dose and schedule for Phase 2 and believe that the anti-tumor activity, favorable tolerability, and the convenience of a short infusion reinforce the ongoing expansion of IMGN632 monotherapy in BPDCN, AML, and ALL. Additionally, we initiated our IMGN632 combination trials with azacitidine and venetoclax in relapsed and frontline AML, as well as IMGN632 as a monotherapy in minimal residual disease positive AML patients and look forward to continuing patient enrollment in 2020 and sharing data at ASH. With that, I'll turn the call back over to Mark for some closing remarks. Thanks, Anna. Just a few thoughts before we open the call for Q&A. After a challenging year, we've emerged with strong prospects for the business with important near-term catalysts for our lead program, our earlier stage portfolio accelerating, a strong cash position to advance our portfolio to material inflection points, and an experienced management team to deliver on the business. We look forward to an exciting and productive next 12 months, and with that, we'll open the call for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question at this time, please press star than one on your touchtone telephone. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Our first question comes from John Newman of Canaccord. Your line is now open. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, so, Question for Anna uh, and Mark. Um, just curious if you could give us a rough sense as to the number of patients for the forward two platinum agnostic doublet um, that we might see uh, mid-year, and wondering if any of the patients uh, within that group would have received prior uh, Avastin therapy. Thanks. 
So the co yeah, sorry. So the cohort is uh, 60 patients, and yes, uh, a number of those patients will have received uh, prior Avast, and I can't say right at the top of my head how many that is. Okay, great. And then um, just a quick question on on Soraya. Um, I'm assuming that given in the U.S. Um, getting reimbursement for more than one uh, line of Avastin uh, has been a little bit challenging until recently. I'm wondering if the patients in the Soraya will have just one prior line of therapy with Avastin or if you might have a few patients that um, would have more than one. Thanks, John. Uh, so Soraya is being enrolled in uh, the U.S. as well as in Europe, um, and historically, typically, patients really only get one line of Avastin if they do have access to it at all. And remember, this is patients with platinum-resistant disease with one to three priors. So um, the only data that I'm aware of really showing that um, Avastin after Avastin works is from the Mito Mango study where um, it was shown that um, after frontline treatment with an Avastin-containing regimen, you still got benefit in the, the recurrent platinum-sensitive setting. Um, uh, with another Avastin regimen. So we anticipate that very few patients will have had more than one prior line uh, of Avastin. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from Byron Ammon of Jeffries. Your line is now open. Yeah, hi, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, Anna, on the forward to uh, trial with the triplet, can you just maybe give us what next steps are? You know, I think... Um, in 2019, you presented some data there and about 41 patients saw pretty strong response rates and DOR. How much additional data do you need to see before um, you move the triplet forward in, into a pivotal study? Yeah, so uh, we will be presenting longer-term data from the triplet, uh, likely at ESMO this year, where we should have mature PFS data. Um, you may recall that the benchmark for other triplets so <clears throat> Carbo, Gem, uh, Bev, and Carbo, Pack, Bev, there the median PFS is somewhere around 12 to 14 months. Um, Carbo, Doxel, Bev also read out at ESMO last year or the year before, also looking similarly. So those are, those are the benchmarks, and so we'll see how our triplet uh, stacks up in terms of PFS as well as uh, safety and tolerability, and then we'll uh, take it from there. Um, any potential registration option for that triplet would be a large, long trial. Uh, so we're, we'll be examining the data quite closely. Okay, and then um, on IMGC 936, the Atom 9 uh, ADC, uh, you had presented, I think, uh, last year at ACR some preclinical data and given you're moving this program into IND, are you uh, going to be stratifying based on atom line expression? And I guess what tumor types are you uh, looking at in the phase one till? Yeah, so uh, we will be assessing atom nine levels, um, and we will be poised to uh, have a companion diagnostic down the road if needed for patient selection. So early on, we'll be gathering data. Uh, the four tumor types we're initially going to target include pancreatic, gastric, lung, and triple negative breast cancer. There are some other solid tumors that also express ADAM9, but these are the four that we're going after first in the phase one study. Uh, and, you know, based on what we see in dose escalation, uh, we can then certainly uh, do some uh, expansion cohorts. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Annie Hesty of William Blair. Your line is now open. Great. Uh, thanks for taking my question. So one for Mark, I think, uh, you know, the company has been restructuring for the past uh, uh, two or three quarters. Just wondering if the accelerated approval pathway that was clarified in December changed the course of that. Yeah, so um, thanks for the question, Andy. The, the, um, we took the, you know, the largest part of the restructuring uh, took Place in Q2 uh, and early Q3, uh, and you know we were targeting uh, a headcount number, and and there were folks that were transitioning over the back half of the year, um, and you know we sort of got to uh, you know what I'll call a nadir in terms of headcount, 
Um, and with the benefit of the FDA guidance around Saray, uh, we've actually, you know, begun to add a very modest number of heads uh, as we as we go forward. And so um, you'll see from the guidance that we uh, gave, you know, our operating expenses for. Uh, 2020 are going to be in the same range as they were for uh, 2019 on an aggregate basis. Uh, and so, you know, what that reflects are, you know, sort of a leveling of the head count with, as I said, some modest additions, uh, particularly uh, in uh, the clinical and regulatory group from where we thought we were going to be. Um, and then, you know, a significant, you know, ramp in external uh, expenses, um, Versus, you know, say where we were in, in Q3 of, uh, of, of 2019, reflecting the, you know, concurrent uh, execution around both Soraya and Mirasol, and ultimately bringing online uh, uh, 936 uh, later in the year. Okay, excellent. Um, so, in terms of um, from a, I guess, FDA dialogue perspective. Uh, very intrigued by the randomized uh, investigator-sponsored uh, doublet. Just curious about, you know, kind of potentially adding that high-quality data in the regulatory packages. I just want to know if there's any sort of mechanism by which you can include um, investigator-sponsored trial in a in a regulatory package. Hi, this is Teresa. Um, yes, there are certain opportunities to include um, ISTs. Uh, you know, the, the data has to be robustly collected, but FDA would consider that data. This is a combination trial, though, however, so um, it could not be used to support the evaluation of efficacy for monotherapy. Okay, got it. And um, uh, lastly, I think, I think for Anna, uh, um, so. I guess immunotherapy hasn't really been, been used in that, um, but Roche is running a phase three trial that might read out this year. So just curious if, um, you know, in phase 1B monotherapy combination or um, forward one, uh, did you guys look at any IO treated population and how they did with MERV? So, you're right, Andy, that um, checkpoint inhibitors have not really moved the needle in ovarian cancer, um, and I think the large phase three that you're referring to is the IMAGINE study. In terms that's of right, yeah. us, yeah, and, and that's in the frontline setting, uh, incorporating uh, a tezolizumab. Um, you know, in terms of us looking at our data set, looking at patients who've had prior checkpoint inhibitors, um, honestly, there hasn't been enough of them given sort of when we enrolled forward one. Uh, so I, I can't really speak to it, but I will say given the modest activity, like single-digit response rates for, for checkpoint inhibitors by themselves and given the lack of any potential cross-resistance, I don't think prior checkpoint inhibitor uh, therapy would impact uh, MERV activity. Got it. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from Boris Speaker of Cowan. Your line is now open. Great. A uh, couple of questions. So first, on the combo trials, I'm just curious, what's the regulatory strategy in, in, in general? Is the goal to select the best combo uh, and move that forward, or do you anticipate to advance several different combinations somehow in parallel? Yeah. So the first uh, the first up with the combinations um, is to ensure at the time we have regulatory action on the monotherapy around uh, you know a positive outcome from Soraya that we would have sufficient publications to support a compendia listing for the combinations and so um, you know that's that's our initial goal so that to the extent there is discretionary use by physicians that they could obtain reimbursement for that use. Um, yes, longer term, you know, the, the, our goal is to have, you know, an expanded label, particularly to embrace um, platinum sensitive patients. And so evaluating uh, these combinations um, and also in the segment of what we're calling platinum agnostic patients, 
uh, you know, trying to define a, a path forward there. So, you know, the the opportunities here are one looking at the uh, doublet with uh, with Carbo and comparing that to Investigator's Choice, uh, and that's what Harder is doing for us uh, with the AGO uh, in uh, in Germany with this uh, large IST. I think that would be a good guide for us. Um, the the data that we will have um, at ASCO in June with this platinum agnostic co- cohort equally provides us with a you know with a, a strong signal uh, in terms of you know where we might go with the uh, with the program. And you know as Anna mentioned earlier, you know on the as we think about the triplet. Um, some of those, you know, some of those studies get to be very, very large, and I think, you know, we would likely look to cooperative groups to uh, to help uh, with any of those those broader studies. So, um, what I would say is, stay tuned. Um, you know, we've gathered a lot of data. You know, the the key points to date are first that we can combine full doses of mervatoxumab with full doses of everything we've tried at this point uh, without, uh, you know, generating new safety signals. So the drug is well tolerated in, in combination. The efficacy benchmarks that we've hit with mervatoxumab have exceeded the comparable. So, you know, if you look at our uh, Avastin uh, combination data relative to what was reported in Aurelia, we compare very favorably uh, there, the triplet compared favorably uh, to uh, you know, you know, these are high benchmarks too. I mean, some of the studies with triplets are in the in the low 80s, and when we look at apples to apples, we got to a 90 percent uh, response rate in those patients. So, you know, I, we're encouraged, and I think the you know the question will be, what can we do on our own? What can we rely on the cooperative groups? Um, and along the way, ensuring that. Uh, to the extent that uh, physicians are encouraged by the early data and want to use the drug that they can obtain reimbursement here in the U.S. Gotcha. Um, my second question is on 632. I'm just curious, what indications do you see as having the shortest path to approval? Yeah, BPDCN. Uh, so, you know, we reported data on a small cohort of nine patients at uh, at ASH, uh, and we had three responders uh, in that group, all of which or all of whom had uh, previously received Elzonris. And so, the goal for us, Boris, is to collect uh, sufficient data in this uh, relapsed uh, BPDCN uh, population to see whether we can, you know, create a dossier sufficient to approach FDA for a breakthrough therapy designation in this patient population, and as part of that discussion, define how many additional patients they would like to see uh, in order to support an accelerated approval uh, for that uh, for that indication. And so you may remember that I think the number of patients supporting the Alzheimer's approval was around 50, between 50 and 60, and so uh, those numbers could be reasonably modest. And what we've done with 632 is go to Europe and open sites, um, and the you know investigator and patient response there has been quite encouraging from an accrual standpoint. Uh, you remember, may remember that Stemline did not go to Europe with uh, with that drug, and so um, we've been able to, to take advantage of that from a patient accrual perspective, uh, which I think will allow us to you know accumulate the data we need to go have the conversations uh, with FDA. Gotcha. Uh, maybe just the last question on IMJN 151. How does it differ from Mervatoximab? Yeah, so um, we have a new linker and payload for uh, that program, and then we've also done some antibody uh, engineering to improve the, uh, the PK, and so um, we will have data at AACR uh, in April uh, where we can talk in more detail about uh, the improvements that are reflected or embodied in that molecule. Great. Thank you very much for taking my questions. Sure. Thank you. And again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question at this time, please press star than one on your touchtone telephone. And our next question comes from Jessica 5, J.P. Morgan. Your line is now open. Hey, guys. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Uh, if you have Soraya data in mid-21 and file that in the back half of 21, what are the potential implications to that review if Mirasol fails to meet its endpoint while that BLA is 
under review with the FDA. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so um, Soraya is, is, you know, is based on a surrogate endpoint. Uh, I think if, you know, I think we would be challenged candidly if uh, if the given the accelerated approval uh, based on overall response and DOR as a surrogate, um, if we then, you know, came out with data in, uh, in, in Mirasol that showed no statistically significant difference uh, on a full approval endpoint, I, I think that would be a challenging circumstance for, 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 for the agency. And just thinking about the timelines here, I think clinicaltrials.gov is pointing to June of 2022 for Mirasol. So, yeah, first half, but conceivably could read out after that decision. Is it possible that, that the timelines kind of play out that way where you get the accelerated approval and Mirasol reads out after FDA has kind of made a call on yeah, I, mean, yeah I, I think that's probably the more likely scenario here, and I get there in the following way. So we previously have drafted substantial segments of the BLA for uh, mervituximab, and you know those things are not going to change as it relates to you know preclinical and so on. So essentially, what we're looking for uh, is a clinical component to uh, to the BLA. So. Our view is that we can move very quickly from the readout of the top line data to the submission for, uh, you know, supported by Soraya. Um, you know, we've got priority review for this. Um, well, we have fast-track designation going yeah, to state approval. Yeah, sorry, review, thank so. you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, my sense is that, you know, the FDA, particularly in these patient populations where there is significant unmet need, and, you know, that was one point of very clear alignment between us and the agency around these, you know, uh, platinum resistant uh, patients previously treated with uh, Avastin. So, you know, our expectation is they're going to move quite quickly on this application. And so we're saying 2022 because that's a, you know, that is a reasonable timeline for them to act on this application. Uh, but, you know, in, in cases where they have, you know, uh, you know, where data are good and, uh, the need is high. They, they've acted in, you know, in, in shorter time frames, you know, in three or four months in some cases. And so, you know, we'll see. But, um, you know, I, I do think that the likely scenario is regulatory action on Soraya followed by uh, readout of Mirasol. Okay, got it. And when we think about the um, 70 patient kind of group who look like they would meet the enrollment criteria for Soraya. Um, I'm just trying to think about, are, are you going to present that uh, that analysis so, so we can kind of take a look at it and see more nuance around the, you know, number of priors and background therapies those folks have had? I'm wondering if those patients might, you know, given kind of the mix of trials they came from, might end up being a little bit sicker on the margin than the ones who are going to end up being enrolled in Soraya. Hmm. So uh, we don't have any plans to formally present additional details on those 70 patients, uh, Jess. We, you know, we did a lot of spade work uh, looking through our program to really understand uh, who the patients are who've already been uh, treated with mervituximab to give us confidence that Soraya will have a high probability of technical success. So at a very high level, these are all patients with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer. They've all had one to three prior lines of therapy. They're all FR alpha high by PS2+, plus, and they've all had bevacizumab at some point uh, prior to receiving mervituximab. The vast majority of them came from the phase three trial, uh, and about somewhere around 14 or 15 of them came from the, the phase one trial. So, you know, we've, we've looked throughout, and we're, we're confident that uh, we will be able to replicate these data in terms of ruling out uh, a 12% response rate. The one very minor nuance um, that may uh, be uh, informative for you is that when we enrolled, uh, when we designed Forward 1, we excluded primary platinum refractory patients, um, and uh, there those were patients who progressed within four weeks 
of um, platinum, of their last dose of their first-line uh, platinum. Subsequently, talking with key opinion leaders, uh, they have uh, suggested that primary platinum refractory disease should really be those patients who progress within three months of the prior platinum. So um, we are not enrolling those patients in forward one, nor, uh, sorry, we're not enrolling them in Soraya and Mirasol m- moving forward. Um, you know, in the randomized trial setting, that would have, you know, a similar impact probably on, on both arms, uh, not so much on Soraya, but the benchmarking we've done for Soraya uh, takes that into consideration as well. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from Jonathan Chang of SCV. Larry, your line is now open. Hey, guys. This is David Rue, Sean for Jonathan. Thanks for taking our questions. Um, you guys have mentioned in the past the neoadjuvant opportunity for MRF plus chemo, and uh, it seems like a setting where KOLs would be receptive to using an ADC. Could you just elaborate a little bit on how you're thinking about potential combinations and design of these studies down the road? You're absolutely right. Uh, a neoadjuvant trial is a high priority for our investigator-sponsored trial strategy. Uh, and all I can say is we're having active discussions and we're really uh, excited to be in a position to have those discussions and get a trial uh, up and going uh, with our investigators. All right, great. And to clarify, that would be an IST or? Yes. Okay, okay, great. Um, Thank you. And uh, next for me, um, now that the forward one data are a little bit more mature, have you considered presenting any type of retrospective biomarker analysis that maybe looks at the longitudinal expression of foliar receptor alpha in these patients over time? So that would require serial biopsies, uh, which were not mandated as part of the protocol. Uh, so patients were enrolled primarily based on archival tumor tissue from their initial diagnosis. Uh, if for whatever reason archival tissue was not available, they could have had a fresh biopsy. But we were not subjecting these patients to sequential biopsies uh, during their participation in the Phase three trial. So unfortunately, we would not have the data available that you're requesting. Okay. Okay. Do you think that um, this might be something you do in Soraya? Would you have pre- and post-study biopsies? or? So we did have a biomarker uh, expansion cohort in our Phase one that we presented at SGO several years ago now. Right. Um, and really, it was that study that showed that, you know, there was reasonable concordance between archival tissue and fresh tissue, and then we did biopsies uh, after two cycles. Uh, I should note that there were a bunch of patients who had such tumor shrinkage on that arm that they couldn't actually get a biopsy after two cycles, so we had to over-enroll the cohort. Um, That cohort also allowed for biopsies at progression, and you can imagine that that's a pretty hard conversation for an investigator to have with a patient saying, I'm sorry, the drug is no longer working. Um, We'd like to subject you to a biopsy to see what's going on. Um, At that point, patients typically prefer to engage in conversations around what's next from a treatment perspective. Mm -hmm. All right. um, Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. And our next question comes from Kenneth McKay of RBC Capital Markets. Your line is now open. Uh, hi, thanks for taking the question. Uh, just wondering in BPDCN if you could help us understand sort of where the efficacy bar is uh, behind Elzonris and if that is sort of the area of highest um, medical need or as you're uh, looking at potentially uh, going through a breakthrough designation process here or, or a uh, potential regulatory um, trial design, if you could go uh, potentially in front of that or um, if it had to be behind. Thank you. Yeah, so as Mark mentioned, Elzonris was approved based on somewhere around 50 or 60 patients uh, worth of data for BPDCN, larger safety database. But um, the responses in the label for Elzonris in the relapse setting are, I think it was two out of 13 patients. Um, certainly, if you look at their New England Journal article, they had um, additional partial responses, but those were not considered by FDA. Um, and then if you look in the frontline setting, Elzonris' response rate was certainly higher. Um, so we think there is a high unmet need for patients who've already had Elzonris, and I think the three out of nine responders that we've had um, 
certainly from a proof of concept perspective, while small numbers, um, you know, is quite encouraging. Uh, we're also hearing that, uh, you know, not every patient is appropriate for Elzonris. Certainly, um, you know, if you look at the label uh, with the potential for capillary leak there, patients uh, with low albumin uh, are not appropriate for Elzonris, and patients with cardiovascular uh, or renal comorbidities who perhaps couldn't handle the cardiovascular challenge that capillary leak would pr uh, pose for them. That might be another area where uh, we might be able to demonstrate uh, both activity uh, as well as safety that could be supportive of going uh, up front in frontline BPDCN patients who have not been previously treated with Elzonris. Uh, and, you know, at this point, our heads are down. We're, we're enrolling patients. We're gathering the data so that we have an informative data set uh, with which to engage the regulators. Interesting. Thank, thank you. And then could we see an update from uh, an expansion of that at, at EHA, or would that be ASH we're going to see? Uh, I, I, would, I would suspect that ASH would have a, a bigger data set uh, with longer duration, which will be important. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude our question and answer session. I would now like to turn the call back over to Mark Entity for any closed remarks. Great. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, very much appreciate the uh, participation and good questions today, and we look forward to keeping you updated on our progress uh, throughout the remainder of the year. Thanks very much. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. Can we now disconnect?